Hi there, I'm your host, John Iverson, and welcome to the show. This week, I'm joined by fellow National Post columnist, Sabrina Madeau, and managing partner at Rubicon Strategies, Andrew Balfour. Welcome to both of you. I'd like to start by taking stock on where we are in the electoral cycle. Uh, in short, nowhere good for the Liberal Party. A new Abacus data poll has come out. Uh, Pierre Poilievre's Conservatives are in majority government territory. Justin Trudeau's Liberals are below 30% support. A majority of Canadians feel that the country is heading in the wrong direction. And large majorities think that the Liberals are not focused enough on things like the cost of living and housing. Andrew, that's a pretty gloomy prospect if you're a Liberal backbencher. Is there nervousness in the caucus, do you think? I think that there's numbers like this. I mean, we saw Nanos come out with some similar numbers uh, 10 days ago or so. Uh, of course, you're never going to feel good when you see numbers like this. But at the same time, it's unlikely that there's an election around the corner. So, you know, there's always time to write the ship. The thing that I took out of the numbers that I found the most interesting was that both all Canadian voters, liberal voters, and uh, accessible liberal voters all had the top three issues that they thought the government was paying too much attention to, which was climate, indigenous, and the war in Russia, uh, given that those first two are signature planks of the liberal brand since 2015. That's uh, an odd one to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sabrina, do you think this looks and feels like a government that's in its latter stages, maybe even on its last legs? It's certainly a sign, but I think it's too early to say it's a definite one quite yet. Um, we've seen the Conservatives lead in the polls before, certainly leading up to the 2021 election. Um, not by quite this much, but it's a snapshot in time, and a lot depends on when the next election happens. And ultimately, the Liberals have a lot more control over that than the Conservatives do. Uh, like Andrew had said, the issues are really interesting in terms of what's important to Canadians and what this means going forward. Uh, when you're moving away from more social justice issues into the economy, healthcare, those are areas where Canadians need to see actual action in their daily lives. There need to be results. You can't just make announcements and statements if people don't see the change in their bank accounts, their ability to pay rent, uh, their ability to see a doctor or get seen at the hospital. So that's going to present some challenges for a Liberal government that's been really great at announcing things, but not so great at delivering them. Andrew, what about uh, the perils for Pierre if, uh, if he potentially peaks too early? Um, I mean, it does mean that the prospect is raised of those who are angry with, with Trudeau having to confront the prospect of a, of a Poilier majority. Well, at some point in time, you're going to have to go away from talking about everything that's broken and talk about what you might do about it. And as <clears throat> we've seen using the passports as, ex as an example, he doesn't have that to go on about because that issue's over, the Nexus issue's over. I renewed my Nexus the other day and within less than 48 hours got my renewal. Like, that, all the, like a lot of the things that he's been chipping away at are getting fixed. So. And I mean, even by the time of an election, it's, it's possible that uh, uh, the cost of living issue is less pressing. I mean, inflation will still be with us, but it might not be uh, as, as pressing a concern, right? And there could no longer be, you know, this ongoing issue with the premiers around health care because, you know, we're right. well, we, let's come on to that. But um, I mean, just let's stay with Pierre, Pierre Poilievre at the moment. Sabrina, do you think he's striking the right tone to reassure people who might be nervous at the prospect of a conservative majority? I think he's very strong on the economy, and I think he needs to branch out and let more Canadians get to know him. He obviously has a very strong brand with conservatives. Um, I think other swing voters could probably still get a better idea of who he is and the fact that the conservatives the conservative leadership and pair are starting to do more mainstream media it looks like in the new year should be helpful with that uh, when I had interviewed Pierre for the National Post, I was struck by some of the response I got. I expected it to fall very much along partisan lines, but when he did that interview, I got a lot of notes from people who said, you know, I don't vote conservative, I usually vote NDP or liberal, but I saw a new side of him that seemed softer than what I've seen depicted in the press. So I think the more he gets out there, um, the better it'll be for him. Well, Pierre, if you're watching, why don't you talk to the National Post Ottawa Bureau? Because uh, at the moment... We don't get our calls returned, so let's hope he's more open. Um, Andrew, you mentioned the health care issue. I mean, is this potentially uh, transformative to the fortunes of, of the Liberals? Well, it depends on how it works out. Um, 
a lot of people seem to be very upset about the healthcare system right now for many, many good reasons. And I think that you know, much to the point I made earlier about how passports are now off the table, uh, if all of a sudden that's not off the table for another whipping boy, then you're starting to get rid of broken things and more fixed things. Might make the uh, leader of the opposition have to uh, change his tone on that kind of thing if there's fewer things to beat up on. Sabrina, the, the, um, we don't know what the deal looks like yet, but the prospects are that it's, it's a, a bigger Canada health transfer payment and more money for mental health and uh, uh, doctors that the, the Liberals promised in the last election. At the same time, the government doesn't seem to be too exercised about Doug Ford's um, experimentation with private delivery, as long as there's a single payer. Uh, do you think this is a potential uh, flashpoint for for uh, the relationship between the government and or between the Liberals and the NDP? Jagmeet Singh is out there saying that uh, the government, that the Conservatives want to bring in American-style for-profit corporations to run healthcare. Um, and that Justin Trudeau's in cahoots, and yet at the same time he's still propping the Liberals up with it with a supply arrangement. How does that come out? Fall out? Do you think? That's interesting because I think well, polls show most Canadians are open to different solutions in healthcare as long as they're not having to pull out their credit cards, um, and we already right. see a lot of private delivery. But Jagmeet Singh's taken such strong rhetoric and such a strong stance on this, like you said, that he's going to Americanize Canadian health care, that this is really undermining the Health Care Act. Um, and with that sort of rhetoric, I don't see how Jagmeet Singh doesn't find himself backed into a corner if he continues where he might have to break the deal and ultimately force an election. Now, I don't think that's something he wants, so he has to be very careful uh, about right. how he continues to approach and speak about this. What do you think of that, Andrew? I mean, the, the Abacus poll was interesting on Singh, and it suggests that he's lost a lot of goodwill because of his deal with the Liberals, um, yet he's claiming he's getting stuff done, and yet, on, on the other hand, he's now decrying the Liberals for their American-style healthcare proposals. So what, how do you think that plays out? I have a hard time believing that an NDP voter is moving to the Pierre Polyavra uh, camp, uh, they might be a possible green switcher, but they're more apt to be a liberal switcher. Uh, I also think that he's not being entirely honest around... Most Canadians don't understand, as you just said, private delivery is different than privatization. I don't think he's being honest with Canadians about what is happening. I mean, American style means I can walk in and pay and skip a line and get everything done. That's still not the case. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, so part of the reason that... Uh, the Liberals are upsetting people is that they keep doing dumb things. And one of the dumbest things that, that they've done in recent weeks uh, must be the decision to po uh, appoint uh, Amira El Gawabi as the Canada's first special representative on combating Islamophobia. The appointment was, in Trudeau's words, designed to build bridges, uh, but I think mainly building a bridge between the Liberal Party and Muslim voters. Inevitably, El Gawabi has had some sharp words to say about Quebec's Bill 21, uh, which has led to outrage in that easily offended province. I mean, frankly, how could she not have, uh, given, given that it's blatantly discriminatory and she's a Muslim? Uh, anyhow, as soon as Trudeau and the Quebec Liberal Caucus clicked to the fact that this was not popular in Quebec, they've all but disowned her. She's now uh, a representative to the Canadian government, not for the Canadian government. Uh, start with you, Sabrina. I mean, what a mess. What do you make of it? Well, first of all, politically, just such a self-own. Now they have everybody upset at them. Quebecers are upset at them. Um, those who are against Bill 21 and do see it as discriminatory are also upset at them for looking hypocritical. So this is really a no-win any way you dice it. Um, and you do have to wonder, like, but it, but it was, did they it not was never see this be a coming? Win. No, right, no, that's exactly. the thing. Like... <laughs> Why? And in terms of the appointment, did they not see this coming and prepare a response? It seems like once again they were caught off guard by something that's very easily Googleable about one of their hires or their candidates. So like, why aren't they doing basic Google searches on the people they work with? And if they choose to move ahead, then have a prepared strategy and response. It's again this focus on announcements and then once something's announced, all chaos breaks loose. Andrew, is there anybody left in this government who has sound judgment and managerial ability? 
Well, of course there are. There's still lots of people around who have uh, good judgment. But I, and I'm not. I'm not going to say that this was a, a good move in any way, shape, or form. However, I don't think that it plays to a huge audience, and I don't think it moves a lot of votes. I mean, it it certainly it plays. Does it Quebec? The, right, but only certain areas, and we we both know where this goes in Quebec, and those aren't liberal voters for the most part either. I don't know about that. It's um, it, this is a. a I sympathise with the government to some extent in that they're obliged to intervene it's in no the L21. Win. It's a no-win. Uh, you know, as the guardians of the charter, they're obliged to intervene in, the, uh, uh, in opposing Bill 21. The, the, a Quebec Court of Appeal will hear this case, uh, pronounce on this case very soon. It will then be appealed either by the Quebec government or uh, by the other side to uh, take it to the Supreme Court of Canada, where the Quebec, where the Government of Canada will have to intervene uh, against this, uh, the use of, at least against the uh, preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause in the case of Bill 21. Um, if the Supreme Court and its majority Anglophone judges then overturns uh, a, ru a law made in the National Assembly, I think we're in a real constitutional crisis. So this thing is only going in one direction, as far as I can see. But while that was unavoidable, this mess that we've just discussed was completely avoidable and I think was, again, just done for short-term electoral reasons. Anyhow, we're running out I think out the time, only so good thing they're benefiting on. from is that no other political leader wants to touch this right now either, so that's right, limiting right. reach a little bit. Well, so well with it, the exception that Blanchette loves it. Well, of course, Blanchette except in Quebec, yes. <laughs> and it will be kind of interesting to see how Poilievre comes down in it because... Um, he has to try and find some kind of middle road between where the Liberals land and obviously where Blanchette is. So, uh, Finally, as we speak, Justice Minister David Lametti is announcing that he will delay the extension of medically assisted dying to people whose underlying condition is a mental disorder. Um, that prohibition, The prohibition on that extension was due to expire next month. It will now be another year. I say thank God. I mean, I believe in tightly regulated regulated assisted dying as a hallmark of a, a civilised society. But, you know, even medical professionals um, say that there are some people who are destined for a lifetime of uh, anguish with mental pr health problems. There are others who are treatable and they can't tell the difference. So, th you know, th I think there should be an enlightened balance between access and protection, and the, but we're tilting too far towards access. Dying with Dignity Canada wants to make access extended to mature minors as young as 12 years old, which to me is absolutely an, an absolute anathema. Anybody want to join in on that? Yeah, I think it's absolutely a good thing that, I, it's absolutely a good thing that they're going to review this and take more time because like you said, even those who are pro-made um, in general and do want access, this has gone so far so quickly to the point you have medical experts speaking out and we have reports of people being approved for MAID because they can't access affordable housing or they're in poverty. So to expand this even more is always, without further examination and without further, further guardrails is only gonna open it up to more problems um, and more cases where people can probably be helped in other ways. Right, I mean, the, the, there was the infamous case of the uh, um, Veterans Affairs counselor uh, offering it as a service, um, which is, hmm. it's a long way from from where we started out saying that, you know, for people with, with terminal Ill illnesses, we would um, assist them in dying. Now we're, it, it's sort of uh, on the menu of options if, if life isn't going too well. Well, if and, you rewind it, it started out with the Carter case, which was, ended up in the Supreme Court and was about people who were of sound mind making a decision to end their life because they were uh, suffering now yeah. we're, mo we're moving in this direction. I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that, but it needs to be very well thought out because once it is legislation, you know, it could end up being challenged. It could go to the court. So there's so many, you're opening up Pandora's box. So yeah. you need to make sure that it's right and balanced or else you're going to create a bigger problem than you need. Yeah. And, so I, and what, I guess. What's I guess, another year at this point? Right. And I guess this is a sign that the, 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 the system and the guardrails are working and that we've, we're taking time to, to study it a little bit more. But, uh, but frankly, I don't know whether I need studying because it looks to me like somebody with solely mental health problems or mature minors, this should not be an offer to those people. Anyhow, 
That's the last word. Thank you very much, for, guys, for coming on. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Thanks. for having me.